Welcome to this Beyond Zero e-learning module, which is one of the catch-up modules for the WITS RHI Advanced HIV and TB course. This particular module will be about abdominal HIV cases, part one. Just thank you to WITS RHI and Dr. Dave Stead for the content of these cases and PEPFAR for our funding. So let's start with a first case of a 30-year-old lady who's been recently diagnosed with HIV and community-acquired pneumonia. She's got a CD4 of 170, and she's not yet on ARVs. So let's briefly cover an approach to adenophagia. So what is your differential of a patient that presents with painful swallowing or difficulty in swallowing and is severely immunocompromised? And of course, our first consideration will always be esophageal candidiasis, but there are a few other things in the differential that may be important. Uh, most notable is that it might be caused by lymph node compression on the esophagus, most commonly due to TB, but any other condition that might cause the lymph nodes to enlarge. And then sometimes you can get um, viruses such as CMV or herpes simplex vi virus to give quite severe ulceration um, of the esophagus in patients with very low CD4 counts. There are also causes that are not necessarily related to infection. Um, and one of the common causes of challenges with, with swallowing or ulceration um, would be your gastroesophageal reflux disease um, or GORD. Um, and quite often this is forgotten in the excitement of looking for complicated OIs. Another condition that is often missed, especially in our elderly, is polysophagitis. Um, especially with the antibiotics such as doxycycline. Of course, your enzymes could be an issue. And we see that especially in patients who are quite ill and who are lying down and who therefore do not take enough water with their tablets um, and are lying down straight after having taken their medication. Dysmotility, um, also common in our normal HIV negative population, it can also affect our HIV positive population. But you can also get idiopathic ulceration, again, in the very immunocompromised patients, not very common. Um, and that will be a diagnosis of exclusion by the time you've biopsied ulcers and you can't find any um, reason or cause for them. Um, and malignancies such as Kaposi sarcoma can affect any part of the gastrointestinal tract. And worrying about 15% of patients with Kaposi sarcoma does not necessarily have any visible lesions to, on the skin. Um, often patients who do have gastrointestinal uh, KS will have some palate involvement, so always useful to look in the mouth. So how are we going to manage this patient who's now sitting in front of you having difficulty swallowing? And we're going to use our clinical findings to tell us what we're going to do. And of course, if the patient is oral thrush, that pretty much confirms the diagnosis of esophageal candidiasis, and we can treat her empirically with fluconazole, 200 milligrams, usually for a good 10 to 14 days. But not all patients who have esophageal candidiasis necessarily has oral thrush. So if you do not see oral thrush, you can still use empiric treatment, um, but you certainly would be keeping in mind other causes. And very important is during this two weeks where you're treating with the fluconazole to at least look for TB and perhaps do an X-ray to see if there's any metastinal enlargement. So great, you've treated your patient with their oral candidiasis um, and their adenophagia, but the patient is not improving. And this is now where it becomes important to go back to the drawing board and look for the other causes. So if we go back to our differential, if you haven't yet excluded TB, you will now be looking for TB. Do your x-ray and look for any enlarged nodes. If you find any enlarged nodes anywhere else, very useful to do a finite biopsy. Um, and do remember, we now have uh, very small little bottles that you can order from the NHLS called the Middlebrook Medium um, little bottles that you can use to rinse your needle in after you've done your F&B. And you can actually send that for Gene Expert as well as TB Culture. Another useful tip for patients where you are uh, concerned about disseminated TB but are struggling to get a sputum culture or a sputum Gene Expert for TB, it's useful to send an early morning urine um, which has got quite good yield in patients with disseminated TB. Also might be sometimes quite useful, especially if it doesn't look like there's any TB, to just treat for um, acid reflux routinely. 
one can start sending for dysfertility tests if you still do not have a diagnosis um, and you've treated and looked for all these other causes. But very importantly is to not wait too long um, trying to find a, some other causes. If you've excluded TB, if you've treated for reflux and the patient still has problems, you would need to refer urgently for endoscopy and biopsy or at least organize a barium swallow. And there are certain conditions you're actually not going to diagnose any other way, especially those ulcerations caused by HSV and CMV. If you do refer for an endoscopy, this is a nice slide showing what they might see. And you can see the thick white plaque-like lesions throughout the esophagus. With such severe um, esophageal candidiasis, one would assume to see some um, candidiasis in the mouth as well. Um, and this is here is a slide of actual medication-induced esophagitis, um, showing a little distinct ulcer cause, more in the distal esophagus, um, probably by something like doxycycline or an enzyme or also your biphosphonates. Our next case will deal with something that is actually quite common, but awfully not, often not well managed. Um, we have a 37-year-old male who's HIV positive. He's got a CD4 count of 97. And he presents with three weeks history of passing more than six liquid stools a day. He's now looking extremely weak. The family's brought him in. And you will normally see in the notes that he's had several visits to the clinics over the last three weeks. So very important when we see our patients with diarrhea is to really good, get a good history. And of course, the first thing we want to try and get an impression of is whether this is more acute or more chronic. Because this patient has had diarrhea for more than two weeks, we would already call this a chronic or a persistent diarrhea. Do you want to start checking for basic things? Is this more watery or is there any presence of either blood or mucus? Is it accompanied by other um, more general symptoms such as nausea and vomiting? Are the, is the patient quite sick? This patient is quite weak. Is there also fever, jaundice or other um, constitutional symptoms? What other medications are the, is the patient taking? Have they changed any medications recently? And remember, you're over the counter um, as well. And also remember to ask about recent travel, especially if we're thinking about possible um, pathogens they might have picked up. So I'm not going to cover uh, in detail the acute management. This is usually very well managed, both in our clinics and our hospital settings. We obviously want to make sure that our hydration and nutritional status um, is corrected and preferably using oral dehydration. And we're going to start basically doing our investigations for um, other OIs and doing a thorough examination of our patient. Also, at this stage, we just need to see on what's going on with his ARVs. He says he's been started on ARVs. When was he started? Is he stopping and starting? Has he been on ARVs in the past? But let's rather move on to look at how we approach a patient with persistent diarrhea and with a low CD4 count. And these patients have an extensive differential diagnosis. Um, and it's good to be aware of the full spectrum of possibilities in somebody who has ongoing diarrhea if you want to manage them. Our first causes that we're going to look at is obviously infectious. And the vast amount of these patients are going to have an infectious cause. And the first thing we want to think of in our low CD4 count patient is the coccidian parasite. So your cryptosporidium and your sister Isospora belly. So your sister Isospora belly used to be known as your Isospora, and they've changed the name. And these two, Cryptosporidium and sister Isospora, is actually very common and is often found on the MCNSs in our low CD4 count patients with persistent diarrhea. And every now and then you might also see a result for a microsporidiasis. We can, of course, get our normal bacteria as we do with our HIV negative patients. These tend to be more shorter duration, and your Shigella and Salmonellas might be linked to, um, to your dysenteries. Giardia and Entamubia stilitica is actually much, much more uncommon in the Eastern Cape. And so although they're often routinely looked for, we don't see them um, very often as a, as a common cause of persistent diarrhea. Um, and less common, but also good to keep in mind, is CMV colitis. So the same way that CMV can attack the esophagus, it can also attack the colon. Um, and mycobacteria, mycobacterium avium um, cellularium, your MAC complex, can certainly cause diarrhea, as can normal TB of the gut. There are also several non-infectious causes. Uh, probably here worthwhile mentioning is that a lot of patients who've had acute diarrhea 
can sometimes develop some persistent diarrhea due to a temporary lactose intolerance. Um, and it's important to perhaps just advise the patient for a period of time to not use any milk products and see if that helps to clear it up. Um, but of course, we can also have some of our medication actually causing the problem. Here, the big um, problem with our ARVs is our protease inhib inhibitors, especially lupinavir, ritonavir. And of course, they might have had a course of antibiotics. Um, but it's also possible that HIV can directly attack the gut and cause an HIV enteropathy. These are actually not that common. It's also, again, in the very low CD4 counts. And you would only exclude that after you've had several negative stool cultures and are not finding any other, other cause. And again, as with our esophages, you may also get Kaposi sarcoma of the gut. And again, just a reminder, many patients might not have skin lesions. We can also see your conditions that might have um, not actually be related to the HIV at all um, and might, as you, you would find in your HIV negative patients, such as your inflammatory bowel disease. So just a little tip when you do take your history in terms of the type of diarrhea the patient is having is that small bowel diarrhea is quite different from large bowel diarrhea. So your small bowel diarrhea tends to be large volume and watery. And this is most commonly caused by isospiridiasis and cryptosporidiosis. So those you can actually pick up quite easily just through the history. Where your large bowel, di bowel diarrhea tends to be more small volume, tends to be more often, tends to have more mucus. Um, and both your MAC and your CMV colitis tend to, attend, tend to attack um, the colon. And you would therefore have a different picture than with your patient with, with isosporidiasis or cryptosporidiasis. So what will we then therefore, how would we therefore approach our patient who is presenting to you with chronic diarrhea? And of course, we're going to take some basic bloods. We want to do a full blood count, mainly to see whether we can get a clue of the chronicity of the diarrhea, especially to see if they might be losing blood through the gut. Is this patient anemic? Um, and is there an increased white cell count that might indicate a more bacterial cause? We want to see if the hepatocellular, the hepatobiliary tract is in, is, might have been um, Inf might have been involved, so you do an ALT and a bili. And of course, because of the dehydration and the loss of fluids, we want to check the kidneys as well. But after you've done your bloods, the probably most single, most important investigations in patients with persistent or chronic diarrhea <coughs> is to actually send stool samples. And these are often missed in our clinics. And you want to send your stool for MCNS, ovine parasites. You want to request Clostridium difficile if indicated. <clears throat> and very important, do note on your specimen that this patient is HIV positive because the lab will actually then search for a different set of organisms. The labs now routinely on our patients who are HIV positive will do a modified oramine stain on the stool to help us find some of these coccidian um, parasites. But again, if you've done several stools and all of your stools are coming back negative, it's important to take the next step to actually make a diagnosis. At this point, you would have to <clears throat> consider doing a gastroscopy or diagenal biopsy, depending on the, on the picture. This is just to show you um, two ways of making the diagnosis. So on the left there, we've got a stool sample with a modified um, Zetin stain, and you can see the cystospore belly oocyte there. Um, that's the one who used to be known as isosporiasis. And then on the right there, we have an immature oocyte that you can see there within a duodenal biopsy that confirms the diagnosis. When we therefore try and manage our persistent diarrhea, the most key and most important part of your management is making a good diagnosis. <clears throat> and therefore, your stool MCNS is actually going to direct your treatment. If you do diagnose a sister isospora, then we can treat that very effectively with cotramoxacil. Notice the dose there. It's four tablets twice a day for 10 to 14 days. So with Bactrim, we have to differentiate um, between the prophylaxis dose, which is only two tablets a day, between our, our normal antibiotic dose, um, which is two tablets BD. For isosporiasis, we use a higher dose of four tablets BD. And then remember, if we trade to PJP, um, your pneumocystis gerovecchi pneumonia, that's actually 12 to 16 tablets a day. It's always worthwhile looking up to give the correct dose. 
Cryptosporidium is not that easy to manage, and these patients can sometimes be very sick. They can quite often have quite severe vomiting um, with the diarrhea, and often they might need admission. The only thing you can do for these patients is get them onto ARVs, and then the immune system can then help um, to sort out the cryptosporidium. Every now and then you will see microsporidiasis on your MCNS, and that responds very well to albendazole, 400 milligrams BD. But note you have to give a full month to make sure you um, manage it properly. Now, very, very important, there is still a habit to try and use empiric antibiotics for chronic diarrhea. Try and avoid it at all times. And if you are tempted to use it because you have explored other options, I will discuss those patients with a specialist. Um, very important to remember, we need to initiate these patients on ARVs, especially if you haven't found anything on the stools. And anti-motility agents such as your loperamide, use with massive caution. They can sometimes be of use in short term where you have patients where you're still working them up and it is causing um, havoc with, sick, for example, transport and with their um, ability to cope at home. The challenge with anti-motility agents is that they work through paralyzing the bowel which you don't particularly want to do if there is an infective agent um, in that bowel. But most importantly, if all of this comes back negative, your patient has still got diarrhea and is still losing weight, remember to refer for your endoscopies or gastroscopies um, as appropriate. Just as a quick slide on dysentery, um, those are usually very easy to diagnose on your stool MCNSs, and again, not as common in your chronic patients. Shigella and Salmonella, Shigella responds quite well to a short dose, dose of Ciprofloxx or IV uh, Salmonella, you'll treat a few a little bit longer. Um, and dysentery often has left fossa iliac pain, they often have fever, they're often quite sick, these patients, but more of an acute picture. Another note just to be aware of is that both Cystrosporum and Cryptosporidium can track up the bile tract and can actually be related to HIV cholangiopathy, and you might not necessarily find the organisms in your stool cultures. This is an interesting little article uh, published in 2012 discussing eight specific patients with recurrent isospora. Um, and although a lot of patients respond very well to the cotrimoxazole treatment, we do have some patients that even if they're on ARVs, even with their CD4 counts recovering, there seem to be a recurrence of the isospora. Very useful to re also refer these patients and just to ensure that there's not other factors that might be contributing um, to the problem. Now, just a couple of tricky histology slides added in by Dr. Stead. Um, here we have a um, brown and Ben stain, and that's a histology there of tubular cells. Electron micros microscopy of the same tubular epithelial cell. This is actually um, microsporidia that was diagnosed on a patient. And microsporidiosis, or microsporidiosis, um, you can use both pronunciations, can actually be found in a wide range of different organs. They can attack the bowel and your small bowel enteritis, and that's probably the only ones that we actually routinely pick up on our MCNSs. They can also track up your bile tract, can also infiltrate the liver, um, might affect the kidneys, your central nervous system, and your muscles. Uh, more commonly, we sometimes see um, ocular lesions, but it can also affect the sinuses and very rarely the skin. These are uncommon manifestations and will be in patients with very, very low CD4 counts. Thank you very much for joining us for this module. Be sure to complete part two to complete the session.